ancient Rome, around 90 AD. It's a time of legendary heroes, notorious emperors, and gigantic spectacles. Chariot racing was by far the most popular sport in ancient Rome. As passed down by many ancient sources. There's this excitement, there's the, the fans going crazy. The charioteers were huge superstars. And he was the greatest, Scorpus. Scorpus rose up from slavery and achieved immortality. Experimental archaeology reveals astonishing details. This is not like the Ben-Hur chariots. This is a sleek racing machine. Eternal City. For nearly a millennium, its rulers dictated every facet of life across much of the known world. By 90 AD, the empire is reaching the peak of its power. It's 30 years since large parts of the city burned down under Nero. Rome's current emperor, Domitian, has undertaken an ambitious and far-reaching program of urban renovation. The court poet Marshall proclaims, the city of Rome, under Domitian, is like a phoenix rising again from the ashes. Domitian is the third emperor of the Flavian dynasty and is deeply disliked by the Senate and the Roman elite. However, he maintains huge popularity amongst the people. Rome in 90 AD is the capital of a huge empire and it's a huge city, a million inhabitants, which by pre-industrial standards is enormous. No city gets to that size until London in about 1800. So everywhere there were people, there were crowds. To keep the masses entertained, the Flavians put on a series of annual spectacles, the Ludi Romani, the Roman games. And with his poet laureate, Marshall, Domitian has the perfect PR consultant. I think spectacles are a big thing of the Flavian brand. The epigrams written by a Marshall, which were written to commemorate the spectacles put on by the Flavians, including the inaugural games of the Colosseum under Titus. Uh, and so clearly it's part of the brand. Uh, there's an association of having given Rome back to the people after the dreaded Nero, uh, and he's continuing this, this association. The greatest spectacles the emperor can give to the people are the chariot races. They are preceded by a series of opulent and grandiose celebrations. It was obviously great fun, uh, the huge thrill of the excitement. It was a day to take your children, for a father to take his son and teach him all the tricks of the trade about how to be a good charioteer. Prior to the event, a huge procession moves through the city. The whole of Rome is on their feet. Domitian wants to be seen to be popular and he wants to be seen to be giving people the kind of entertainment that they really loved. By then, Rome is the greatest city on earth. And the Circus Maximus is by far the largest structure ever built in the Roman Empire. 
three times the size of the Olympic Stadium in Berlin. Many emperors strove to embellish it and thereby to leave their mark. Domitian has even added an imperial box which allows him direct access from his palace. The Circus Maximus is the Roman circus. It was the most famous known in the whole Roman Empire. It's the biggest, the oldest. This circus where you would want to be. From the outside, you would see this monumental building, but then if you go inside, you'd be in a completely different world. 150,000 people around you, the noise, the smells of animals competing. Maybe you could even smell the fear of some of the young charioteers. And you could probably also smell the latrines in the stands. First and foremost are the Ludi Romani, the Roman games, which are held in honor of the gods in particular Jupiter, the protector of the state and the laws. For the occasion, his statue would be removed from the temple of Jupiter and solemnly paraded with other gods through the bustling streets of the city. Religion is embedded into every part of Roman society, so games, war, whatever, Thing the Roman state did, religion was involved. And so you've got to remember, you know, if the emperor is presiding over the games, so are the gods. In true lavish Flavian style, this is no ordinary event. It's called the Pompus Ascensus, the circus parade. There was this amazing procession that went through the city of Rome, known as the Pompa. We got our word pomp from this. And this is a really huge and impressive procession that snakes its way through the city of Rome and ends up at the Circus Maximus. A Greek historian, Dionysius of Halicarnassus, has given a detailed description of the Pompa. The Pompa was received by the crowd and they were crying for the emperor. They were crying for Domitian, you are our hero. You organize for us these great uh, festivals. It's a mile long pageant displaying the whole spectrum of Roman society, featuring not only gods, but also actors musicians, athletes, and benefactors. It's a day when no one stays at home. But the true stars of the parade are the charioteers. And one in particular holds near legendary status, even in his lifetime, Scorpus. In the Museo Lapidario in Urbano, Italy, there is a remarkable piece of evidence which reveals who this champion was and shows the extent of his fame. American archaeologist Sinclair Bell has studied it in detail. At first sight, this monument doesn't look like anything special. At the top, what we see is the deceased himself at a funerary banquet, holding a wreath and being crowned by a small Cupid-like figure. Like other Romans, the idea seems to be that he wants to be seen celebrating the high life. We have here a dedication to the gods of the underworld, and it tells us that the monument was dedicated to Titus Flavius Abascantus. 
he was a clerk of the courts and that the tomb was set up by his wife, Flavia Hesperis. But what makes this monument really special is the scene that we have here. The charioteer with his four horses in a quadriga. Now we know that it's the charioteer's name is inscribed over his image, Scorpius. Along with that, we have the names of his four horses, Ingenuis, Admetos, Passerinus, and Admetos. So here we have the tombstone for a Roman bureaucrat commemorated by his wife with the image of the sports hero of his day. But why? The image of Scorpius isn't just alluding to her husband's favorite sports hero. He's actually acting as a kind of good luck charm or talisman. Scorpius was immortalized by Marshall. O Rome, I am Scorpius, the glory of your noisy circus, the object of your applause. The charioteers were huge superstars, and because of their celebrity status, even the emperors would like to uh, associate themselves with them. Now, partly this was because it would mean that some of the glamour would rub off on them. Uh, it also reminded people of who was paying for all this entertainment. But perhaps above all, it showed that the emperor shared the passions and the f enjoyment of the people, that he had something of the common touch about him. In ancient Rome, the world of entertainment and the sphere of power are closely interconnected. With emperors and public idols sharing a common platform. Hail be with you, Caesar. And may victory be with you, Scorpius. If you survive the race. Yet the question of who is the biggest star makes personal interaction between emperor and champion a tricky business. Marshall, while idolizing Scorpius, is very clear that the games are in honor of Domitian and would be nothing without him. There, with our eyes and minds, are we, Caesar. So utterly do you alone hold the thoughts of all that the very crowd of the great circus knows not whether Passerinus runs. Passerinus is one of Scorpius's horses and enjoys a degree of fame and veneration that even rivals the emperor's public standing. One of the most famous terms to come out of the Roman world is panem e circensis, bread and circuses, which basically means keep the masses fed, keep them entertained, and they will be happy, they will be pleased with who's in control, and they're not going to revolt or riot against you because they'll be too distracted by everything that's going on, and they're not going to have empty stomachs to be angry. The games are a huge political barometer since this time of the year is the only occasion when the emperor can gauge how he is perceived by the masses. The satyrs, mythological companions of the wine god Dionysus, represent the rowdier elements of the pompa, where their subversive nature takes charge for a day. The hierarchy of the world is turned upside down, with satyrs conversing directly with the emperor making fun of him. The emperor would normally accept the challenge as part of a popular burlesque, keeping the crowd duly amused. But even the satyrs could go too far. Though all classes came to admire Scorpius, chariot racing as a profession is regarded as improper for high-born Roman citizens, since charioteers come from the humblest of backgrounds. It's yours. 
Scorpus started out as a slave, the lowest position in society. The vast majority of the charioteers began this way. So, what do I hear for a guy like this one? Rome was a slave society, and slave markets were fundamental to the one? economy and to everyday life throughout the empire. Then this boy here, He's strong and already able to work. Historians have estimated that up to a quarter of its population was made up of slaves. And what about this beauty? She's just what I need. I'll take her. How much then? Well, all I've got. Anyone else? In the British School of Rome, archaeologist Sinclair Bell has found some interesting evidence on the background of charioteers. This book is the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinorum, or the Corpus of Latin Inscriptions. One of the things that this book does is tell us about the social and legal background of charioteers, including information that we can glean from their names. For example, we have the inscription of Crescens, and this inscription tells us that he was a charioteer. He died at the age of 22, and so we can work out that he began racing at the age of just 13, and thus his career probably would have started when he was about age 10. We can also get information about his legal background. All Roman citizens would have had a three-part name, or trianomena, but Crescens has just one name, which tells us that he was born a slave and that he died a slave. The collection of Latin inscriptions yields yet another interesting discovery. A few pages later, there is a record of a relief from the tomb of Diocles, another of the great names in chariot racing. It lists many victorious champions of his era, and one special mention goes to one Flavius Scorpus. The fact that Diocles honors Scorpus so prominently tells us how famous he was at the time. The inscription even documents the number of his victories, 2,048, Yet it tells even more about him as a person. Even a short name like Flavius Scorpius is really informative. He lacks a three-part name of a Roman citizen. Flavius refers to his former master. And Scorpius tells us that he's probably of Eastern European origin. Scorpius was almost certainly born into slavery, since by the first century AD, the lands of Eastern Europe have been conquered by the Roman armies. Go on, boy. Slaves were property without any rights of their own. Life as a Roman slave could be exceedingly difficult, especially since the master of the household had free reign to do whatever he wanted. Working on a farm would have been very common for a slave boy. He would toil for long days filled with back-breaking work and little prospect of any change ahead. Yet there is a beacon of hope. One of the distinctive features of slavery in Rome compared to slavery in Greece is that a slave had a possibility of, of freedom. And so this is built into the system and it's part of the way in which Roman slavery works. So slaves could be bought and sold, they could be bred on your own estate, but also you could hope if you got lucky, especially if you were a household slave, a city slave, that you might work your way up and buy your freedom at the end of it all. Some wealthy Romans keep racing stables. And this is where Scorpus might have come into contact with the exciting world of the charioteers. Is this a chance for a way out of his miserable existence as a slave? One charioteer who survived to retirement age after a thousand wins was communist. And he went on to train young talent. And there are other veterans of the circus, albeit rather few, who had survived their active career. 
Under their critical eyes, a whole pool of striving youngsters is learning the ropes, all clinging to the hope that one day they might get their big break and become a charioteer. Nearly all charioteers started off as slaves. They were sold into the business by stable owners, uh, and they, they were keen to do it because it was an opportunity to win freedom, to win money, to win glory, above all, to get out of the daily grind of being an ordinary slave. Steady, steady. But the path to freedom and fame is one of sweat and pain. Like many others, Scorpus probably started off as a stable boy. Not all of them would have what it takes to master a chariot. More than anything else, the job requires a fine sense for horses. A rare enough gift, but indispensable when it comes to controlling the steeds in the heat of the races. They must obey and trust their driver and react to the tiniest adjustment of the reins. Scorpus seems to have shown a special talent in handling the sensitive animals. But a successful charioteer also needs great skill and a body of steel. For a trainer, always the question, is my pupil the right one? Shall he be a great uh, victor? And in the case of Scorpus, it was right. He must be prepared for everything. Accidents are rife. There is not only the danger of flying off at bends. Some daredevils even risk a collision to force their opponents out of the race. Your life might depend on being able to keep your balance. Charioteering is not for the faint of heart. Being a charioteer was a dangerous business. You could be killed or you could be badly wounded in one of the crashes that often happened in the circus. But it didn't matter in a way. There were always other slaves who were willing to fill the, the role of those charioteers. They were expendable items for the people who actually controlled the business of the circus. Many charioteers start training as young as eight or 10. Yet before they are entrusted with a proper chariot, they have to undergo years of intensive instruction as a driver, constantly learning from others. After all, chariots are most expensive. Yet the attraction of races was such that they never ceased to capture the imagination. Poets describe their splendor, and their traces can still be found throughout the city of Rome. To this day, when we think of the ancient Roman world, the chariot race comes instantly to mind. Due to the mass appeal of the games, there are some astonishing leftovers. Even back then, there was merchandising, fan articles and children's toys, which were on offer in the stalls outside the circus. No, no, no not this one. Put it down again. The boy will just love Look it. Look here. How much? Three sesterces. <laughs> That's pretty. It's to one of those toys that we owe our knowledge of how exactly the ancient chariots were built. <laughs> Thanks. We'll take it. 2,000 years ago, this was the pride and joy of a Roman child. It was found in the Tiber River at the end of the 19th century. This is the most brilliant thing. It's a contemporary model. 
beautifully made. You can see by its detail that the man who made that knows exactly what he was looking at and is very skilled in making a copy of what he saw. Um, <laughs> luckily, he chose bronze, so it's lasted this long. And it's, it's showing us how they made the full-size ones. Parts of it are bound to be wood. It's going to be a lightweight thing. And it's just a brilliant design. Robert Herford has an ambitious plan. To build a fully workable replica based on the find from the Tiber. Robert is a renowned craftsman when it comes to reconstructing ancient vehicles. First step, the frame. A solid strip of wood is exposed to hot steam for several hours until it becomes malleable. It's a time-honored technique, and just the way the Romans would have done it. We've got to be fast with this, because if the, if the heat goes out of the wood, it won't bend. It... The frame is made up of two wooden strips bent into horseshoe form and then covered with leather. One strip will later become the platform for the driver. The other one serves as a kind of railing at the front. Bending the wood requires a lot of know-how and a sure touch to avoid the formation of cracks. The fibres we softened, they've slid over one another. And as they cool down and harden, they will solidify in that shape. So the thing will retain the shape that we've given it. Having cooled off for two hours, the wooden strips are assembled and the basic structure of the chariot takes shape. Next step, the wheels. This above all is a matter of precision. The wooden parts, the spokes, the hub and the segments of the wheel must be interlocked without a millimetre to spare. The model for this wheel was found in Scotland and could be dated back to 142 AD. Its spokes were made of ash, the hub of elmwood. Now it's time to address the iron hoops. First, Robert must measure the precise circumference of the wheel and then apply the data to the iron band. Again, absolute precision is paramount. Once ready, the hoop must fit the wheel perfectly. The metal is welded into a circle and then heated. That way it will widen and can be put onto the wheel. While cooling off, it will retract and tighten around the wood. To keep the chariot as light as possible, the Romans strung it with leather. At this point, if you dry it, it becomes hard. It shrinks quite a bit. And those two properties are what make it useful for us at this stage. The leather railings serve to protect the driver from dust and stones thrown up by the horses in front. Apart from that, the cover of leather provided a design of great elasticity and acted as a shock absorber. And there it is, a Roman chariot. For Scorpus, however, all this is merely a dream. He is still one of the nameless myriads of slaves, toiling to increase their owner's wealth while longing for another life. And this one.
I'll be the greatest of them all. Yeah. You see me? I'll be the greatest charioteer. No one will ever beat me. Huh? We don't know exactly when Scorpus embarked on his career as a charioteer. We can say, however, that at some time or other, one of the racing stables took him on as a promising young talent. Maybe his skills in handling horses caught the attention of an experienced trainer, impressed by the boy's physical strength and displays of courage. Like horses? Yeah. Chariots too? Yeah. Want to drive one? Then come along tomorrow. I'll show you something. Charities had to be trained. They might be talent spotted at a young age, but they then had to be taught how to drive a chariot. They had to be taught all the tactics that they needed to survive in a race. And for that, they must have looked to retired charioteers, people who knew the ins and outs of the industry, who would be able to really teach them everything they needed to know in order to compete in the circus. The young slave's dream of becoming a champion leads him right into the hub of the Roman entertainment world. It's a multi-million business of cultic proportions, which impregnates the Romans' everyday life and civilization way beyond the circus. The popularity of circus racing is just written in to the material and literary evidence of the Roman world. Uh, it appears everywhere, on people's tombstones, in the mosaics they commissioned in their houses, in the literature of the time, the metaphors appear even in the writings of those elite authors who claim to disprove of it. So really, the cultural importance of chariot racing, I think, cannot be overestimated. As is exemplified by the mosaics in the Bardo Museum in Tunis, North Africa. Historian Carolyn Willikers has researched the importance of horses in ancient cultures. The large scale mosaics give a detailed image of what went on in the circus and a proof of the popularity of the races. What we're looking at is a 6th century mosaic, so it's from a later period, it's Byzantine, but it shows a traditional circus scene, um, and it shows a lot of the characters, the individuals that we would expect to see in such a scene, and it gives us, uh, again, a good idea of the architecture of the traditional Roman circus. One of the things that is unique about this mosaic is that it does depict the audience, but it's an unusual depiction of the audience because they're very passive, which is not what it would have been like. If you read any of the literary descriptions of a day at the races, you know, there's this excitement, there's the, the fans going crazy, yelling and jumping up and down and urging on their teams and almost riding along with the drivers. But what this image of the audience does show us is it, it, gives, it gives us an idea of how popular racing is, right? This was the biggest spectator sport in the Roman world. It was sort of just a huge part of Roman social activity across the empire. The charioteers, of course, were the stars. Yet they needed adequate horses in great numbers. Horses like those still being bred here in Tunisia. 
we know that given the importance of the circus, the Roman circus, throughout the Roman Empire, that thousands of horses were being produced because you needed a huge volume of horses to run a single day of races. One of the reasons we know that North Africa was producing some of the best and some of the, mo the largest number of racehorses, but also some of the best racehorses in the Roman world is because of inscriptions like this one right here. It's basically recording part of the career of a, a charioteer named Avilius Teres, and it's from the first century AD, and it's a list of horse names. And they have names like Romulus, uh, Dromo, and 37 of these 42 names have the initials AF after them, which means Africa. The charioteers of antiquity were looking for horses that combine speed, strength, and endurance. The very characteristics displayed by the Berber horses even today. They are the oldest breed in the Mediterranean basin. Khadija is an expert on Berber horses and knows their distinctive features. What are the physical characteristics that identify mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a barb from other horses? The first thing is the head. So the head is very typical, uh, from, um, especially for a convex profile. Okay, the profi so the, the head comes out. Yeah, comes out. Uh, the eye is like an almond. An almond, okay. Yeah, and the nose, the nostrils are not square like Arabian horses. Round, more, more angled, more yeah. rounded. Yeah, yeah. And what about, he's got a, a very unique looking and neck. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> very beautiful neck. It's thin and large. It's uh, very strong. Very strong. So he can trail, he can trail. Pull really well. Pull, yeah, the chariots. And, uh, so they can work for many, many hours without getting yeah, tired. And they have a, a very strong hoof too. Can they run for a long time? Are they, yeah. you know, excellent yeah. endurance animals? Yeah. They have a good um, cardiac rhythm. Oh, yeah, their heart, yeah. very strong yeah, hearts. very strong hearts. And uh, they can uh, endure the, the physical um, uh, actions. They can resist to uh, the cold, to the, uh, the heat. Uh, the, they can live in the desert, in the, the mountain, uh, everywhere. So they're, they're yeah. very special. Yeah. At long last, Scorpus gets what he has dreamt of, proper instruction. The stable decides to give him a big build-up. For the owner, it's a gamble with an uncertain outcome, yet it may yield enormous gains. Seen in today's terms, a victorious champion is a multi-million dollar asset for his stable. Get off. What's wrong? Just get off. Hey, you. Yes, you. Come here. I have to finish this. That can wait. Get under the chariot. Let's go. Scorpus has made it. Taking the reins, he also takes charge of his own future. Now it's up to him whether this path will lead to success and finally freedom. For a slave, it's a one in a million opportunity.
Once I was like you. You must learn to read and write. A slave you may be, but your heart is free. Two thousand years on in England, the replica of the ancient chariot is about to be put to the test. This is the sports car I've always dreamed of. This is a sleek racing machine. Just look at these curves, the curve of the rail, the sinewy curve of the pole. I mean, these are the ascetics that we admire in a racing car. I mean, I want to get in it. And suddenly now inhabiting the space, it, it's already starting to tell me things. This is not like the Ben-Hur chariots. This is not like any other chariot I've driven where you have a high rail up here. Up here without any protection. That's really Roman, really pushing the theater of the occasion. When I saw it schematically, I thought, oh, well, you know, you've got to be in and I'll rest against this front rail. That's all wasted space behind. Nobody wastes anything on a design like this. And when I think of the mosaics and the art, and actually you tend to see them back here. And that's now starting to make sense, because I look at where the axle is beneath my feet. If I'm back here, then I'm going to be lifting that weight off the horse's necks. That's going to be like taking the brakes off to let them surge forward. What about this little front rail, though? It's stopping the dust being kicked into my eyes. And going round a corner or losing my balance, if I do fall, I'm going to drop to one knee. It catches me. For that purpose, it's the height it should be. The horses are harnessed in line with ancient illustrations. Yet there is a decisive difference to the usual practice. The way regular horse and carriage works is it, you've either got the horse between two wooden shafts, which come down here, either side of the horse, or you've got a horse collar or a breast harness, which attach to the chariot with a strap called a trace. So this would attach to the vehicle, see, and that's what they pull with. They pull on this. There's nothing to attach it to here. The Romans and early chariot cultures did not have these straps. The yoke and pole system simply pulled from the center. And without these straps, you can see there's nothing to hold the horse's hind quarters in. So I drive off without this strap, and this can easily happen. We can get a horse coming over like that, and you can see, if we're galloping along, what a muddle that would be. A further handicap the charioteers had to overcome. Let's give it a go. All right, lads, walk on. Get up, Seamus. Here we go, good lads. Trot on. Trot. Trot, trot. On the sand track of the Circus Maximus, the chariots would reach speeds of up to 40 miles per hour. An enormous strain on man, beast, and material. The replica has passed the test with flying colors. Oh! Good lads. Well, that was thrilling. I mean, to drive two magnificent horses like that at speed. I found it great standing at the back of the chariot here, just behind the axle there, so I'm lifting the weight off their backs, letting them use their power and go on. And I found that my feet were pushing into the sides. And that actually gave me a good bit of stability. 
And I also found myself really leaning back on them, just like we see in some of the mosaics. The real challenge of driving without traces is to keep your horses parallel. And that can only be done with training, training, training. The exercises started with driving with two horses, driving with four horses. It was very difficult to train that. And when you uh, had the ability, the skill ability to do everything, then after a few years you could go to the arena for your first race. Scorpus, come quick. There's been an accident. What happened? I got careless. Go to Rome and win a race for me. Do it for me, Scorpus, my boy. Take this along. Death is a charioteer's constant companion. Their life is at risk in every race, and there are several of them on each day of the games. Marshall poetically describes the fate of many a driver, as often enough they have a premature encounter with the black horses of the racetrack. Yet it's a risk the men willingly accept for fame, wealth, and the prospect of freedom. Scorpus has finished his training as a charioteer. There is but one place to go now. Rome. It will become the stage for a comet-like rise to stardom. Part two of The Greatest Race follows Scorpius's career as the darling of the Circus Maximus and will reveal further secrets of ancient racing. This is a completely different sensation. The races would have been very violent. Their traces can still be found. This is the crucial point where the race is won or lost. The Roman entertainment business reveals its astonishing details, as well as its dark side. You could pay someone to put a curse on the rival team. A glimpse behind the scenes Scorpus. of the ancient equivalent of Formula One. <laughs>